behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our February webinar, The Electronic Resource Librarian's Role in Digital Scholarship and Scholarly Communications, presented by Angela Dresselhaus from the University of Montana, Missoula. Before Angela's presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar will be recorded, and anyone who registered will be emailed a link to the webinar recording. Second, if you have any questions for Angela during her presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box and not into the chat function. To use the Q&A box, you may need to click on the blue Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx screen. You will then see the Q&A box in the lower co right corner of your screen. Then you can type your question below into the Q&A box. At the end of the presentation, Angela will answer as many questions as she can, time permitting. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a SurveyMonkey survey about the webinar. Please take a few minutes to fill that out and let us know how we're doing, what we can do better, or share any ideas you have for future webinars. And with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for the day. Angela Dresselhaus is the Acquisitions and Electronic Resources Librarian at the University of Montana, Missoula, where she manages the Acquisition and Electronic Resources Unit. She is an active member of NASIG and serves as a co-editor of the NASIG Proceedings. And with that, I will turn things over to Angela. Hello, thank you for that introduction. So today, this presentation will provide an overview of current topics in digital scholarship and scholarly communication, which I'll refer to as DSSD, keep things shorter. I will then draw on connect connections between these new areas and the traditional skill sets of electronic resource librarians. And then I will be looking at the, com the commonalities between the skills outlined in the NACIG core competencies for electronic resource librarians and those needed for success in DSSD. This will form the basis of my recommendations for involvement in these areas. The skills held by electronic resource librarians are versatile and can be applied to support emerging trends in DSSD. The NACIG core competencies for electronic resource librarians codified the skills of, the, of ERLs and served as a starting point for connection between traditional library skills and DSSD. First, I'm going to define digital scholarship and scholarly communications for the purposes of this presentation. Then connections will be drawn between the skills listed in the core competencies and activities in DSSD. The next section of the presentation, New Opportunities in Digital Scholarship and Scholarly Communication, will present examples from the various NASIC conferences, demonstrating that electronic resource librarians are already involved in many aspects of DSSD. Next, I will address the new roles based on NASIC conference presentations and the general library literature. And to finish up the presentation, I'll talk about some future steps. The theoretical portion of my presentation discusses a topic that I thought a lot about recently. I had the opportunity to attend a Digital Library Federation forum on a cross-pollinator scholarship. Uh, this, the goal of the award was to expose electronic resource librarian to the world of digital library. And this began my serious thinking on digital scholarship. Many of the forum sessions focused on various digital projects related to faculty research in the field of humanities. The conversation settled on shifting the role of librarians from supporters of research to co-principal investigators. During the beginning stages of the conference, I found it pretty difficult to keep up with the terminology, the concepts, and really just the general dialogue. But then I noticed and made connections between my field and electronic resources and how other traditional library activities intersected with digital scholarship. I knew that I wanted to do something in digital scholarship, but I certainly wasn't ready to jump into 
and into a role as a co-investigator. I had to get a little bit of groundwork laid. And so this groundwork has provided the basis of this presentation. So I'm sharing my experience now, which is from a perspective of a beginner who's been on this journey, I guess for close to about eight months now. And I hope that this next section of the presentation can give each one of you some information to pique an interest in digital scholarship. And I'll have plenty of resources on some of the slides and a complete bibliography if um, you would like to have some self-guided exploration on the topic. So while the term digital scholarship encompasses a wide variety of topics, for this presentation, I will focus on digital humanities, which I'll refer to as DH. Sula, in his article, Digital Humanities and Library, a Conceptual Model, described digital humanities as a well-established discipline with numerous published books, journals, numerous grants at the state and federal level, and many librarians are already speaking about new opportunities in DH. Jennifer Adams and Kevin Gunn, two librarians at the Catholic University of America who have written on DH from the library perspective, provided this definition. That digital humanities is an emerging field revolving around the intersection of traditional humanities disciplines and technology. After reading several definitions and descriptions, my best summation of DH is that it's a field of study where technology and the digital resources are being leveraged to study topics in the humanities disciplines that were pre previously not possible or feasible due to human resource scarcity. Many DEH projects have data visualization and multimedia comp components that expand the definition of scholarship beyond that of the traditional books and peer-reviewed articles. And I'll give you a couple examples in this next section. One broad example is the use of text mining to learn new things about large body of textual work. The National Endowment for the Humanities Office of Digital Humanities supports a software tool called WordSeer to help scholars analyze large textual bodies. A summary of the case study presented at WordSeer uh, at the WordSeer website provides a practical sense of DH. The case study evaluated the electronic text of the North American slave narrative and sought to determine if a scholar's assertions about several stereotypes could be investigated by the use of the WordSeer tool, which is uh, depicted on the slide that's currently available. One investigated stereotype was that of cruel punishments, and this was shown to occur commonly in the narratives, but a second stereotype that was investigated was white father, and the researchers found that it was impossible to use the word seer tool because there are different types of languages and vocabularies that were used to indirectly refer to, um, to the, the concept of implying white parentage used in the slave narrative. And another example that I'll show you This is, uh, on the slide, you'll see an example of um, a project created by DH Scholars. It's called Ildrum. It was created by Kathy Myers and Matt Austin. And this is a map-based project that provides information on Anglo-Saxon burial sites dating from the 5th through 7th centuries in England. And this database allows users uh, to interact with a great deal of information about various cemeteries, um, how many were in existence, the types, what type of burials were um, available, date ranges, and a lot of other information pertinent to researchers in this area. Numerous funding opportunities exist for DH research. The National Endowment for the Humanities devotes their Office of Digital Humanities to supporting the field. The office serves as an advocate, provides information about grant funding, and has a portal for featured projects. The website is an excellent information source for librarians who wish to learn more about DH. Jennifer Adams 
and Kevin Gunn's articles, Keeping Up with Digital Humanities and Digital Humanities, Where to Start, also helps acquaint the uninitiated with DH. And you'll see that on these, um, the purpose of the slide is really to give you some links so that you can do a little bit of exploration on your own um, about these resources. Um, I would specifically suggest going to the National Endowment for the Humanities website. And you can, um, getting a chance to look at some of the projects will really give you a good idea about what's available in that field. Librarians in general are well suited to support and become involved in DH projects. Library, librarians and libraries offer services that support traditional research in the humanities. And as an institution, libraries often have goals that align with DH. For example, Vandegrift and Varner highlight the common goals of DH and libraries, including providing wide access to cultural information, enhancing teaching and learning, and making a public impact. However, the necessary level of library involvement in DH is under debate. According to an OCLC report, does every research library need a digital humanities center? Supporting humanities and continuing to advocate for the discipline is extremely important, but creating a DH center may not be the best interest for every university and its library. So this article really um, would help would help someone new in the field to evaluate if a full-fledged digital humanities center is what's needed at the local library. Some institutions would be served by um, smaller programs, and then some universities do require a lot of support in this area. And so that's going to be something to determine locally. Scholarly communications is the exchange of scholarly ideas, and libraries have a long history of expertise in this area, but as technologies progress, the, ex the expression of scholarly communications has evolved. In the case of DH, research can take the shape of an interactive database. In the sciences, it could be a large data set gathered from an experiment, or in the arts, it could be a musical musical performance or a dance. In this presentation, um, I'll, I'll examine scholarly communications as expressed through library-initiated institutional repositories. Scholarly communications has been a, a, a popular pro, um, topic at the NACI conferences, and this next part of the presentation will sh um, give a, a brief overview of, of a few examples. Carol Hickston presented a pre-conference session at the 2006 NASIG conference titled How to Implement an Institutional Repository. And this session gave practical advice on establishing a local IR based on the presenter's experience at the University of Oregon. Hickson explained that the original impetus behind the IR in general was reactionary to the rising cost of journals and also the increasing output of scholarly materials. Hickston noted that as time progressed, the IR became a way to raise the profile of an institution. It also provided personal visibility to faculty, preserved at-risk materials, and enhanced a cross-disciplinary collaboration. And her presentation really showed an evolution of what IRs started as and came to be at her institution. Banker, Foster, and Wiley presented a session at the 2008 NACIG conference. They gave a detailed outline for implementing a successful IR from the beginning of forming an exploratory task force to implementing a visually appealing and exciting web presence that both the students and the faculty support. The authors noted that an IR can serve several purposes, and it's important to establish why an IR is needed and then develop a, a careful set of services that are tailored to the community. Tosaka and Wing presented at the 2012 conference and discussed the challenges of implementing an IR at a small institution. The presenters noted that implementing an open source solution with limited staffing required them to think like a startup company or like entrepreneurs. And this is an important concept 
and more library-focused continuing education opportunities are discussing applying startup mentality to the library project. So Stock on Win quickly implemented a basic plan with an expectation that they would readjust as the project progressed. They cautioned against developing a fear of failure and encouraged a sense of creativity to accomplish goals. And when you're working with a small number of people, thinking like an entrepreneur could allow you to be in a situation where you could implement new projects quickly and then make revisions um, and adjustments as needed. Wesselick dis discussed the IR at the Utah State University, what he described as a mature repository during his presentation at the 2012 Mesa Conference. His talk focused, um, the focus of his talk was a user study that provided valuable insight to the users of an IR. And as a result of the study, uh, two local collections were specifically identified to address perceived needs of the end users. And Wesselick's presentation highlighted uh, the importance of assessment and responding to user needs. Over the years, we've seen presentations at the NASIG conference progress from workshops on simple implementations at larger institutions, some of the challenges of implementation at smaller schools, and then on to the assessment of the impact of IRs. So what I've observed is that the annual NASIG conference has organically developed a scholarly communications interest track as more ERLs have become involved in the specialty. The University of Montana IR showcases the work of students and faculty and visiting scholars. Materials collected include some of the undergraduate research conference, the Rural Health Workshop that's held on campus, the Montana Law Review, which is a peer-reviewed journal, student government papers, faculty articles, electronic thesis and dissertation collection, course syllabi, and the University of Montana publication. The IR serves many roles for the University of Montana. The conference proceedings and the workshop materials document UM's contribution to the scholarly record, and this is both for an internal audience and for an external audience. The Montana Law Review, um, a peer-reviewed journal, is an excellent example of how a library can step in and help um, the to help a journal remain in um, publication. Collections of the faculty articles and our theses and dissertations captures the intellectual work of both the faculty and students on campus. And in capturing the student government papers and the course syllabi and, and the University of Mon Montana publications preserves a record of our day-to-day -day operations of the University of Montana. And this, uh, I really feel like our IR is becoming a place where people can go and get a snapshot of what's going on at the University of Montana. And this is a, this is a great thing for, um, for historical purposes, research, and just for even marketing to let people know what's going on at the University of Montana. So the libraries at UM have initiated and ma maintained the IR with help from library personnel at all levels. Uh, we have one librarian dedicated to the task, and she doesn't have specific staff members in her department to work on the IR initiative. So I manage a staff of seven employees in acquisitions, electronic resources, and serials. And the unit, this unit, along with some of the faculty and staff throughout the library, assist in this growing institutional repository. We're looking at ways to increase our role in the IR and even possibly to, ex uh, to expand into a cohesive and deliberate action to support digital scholarship on campus. So currently, the electronic resource staff work on issues such as copyright clearance, and they also input metadata for the thesis and dissertation collection. And I found that this was something that was a, a natural extension of the type of work that's going on in the electronic resource um, unit. For example, they're familiar with um, copyright issues with our, with our purchase collections, and they're also familiar with basic levels of metadata. The serials cataloger, 
works closely with the archives and special collections to provide metadata for university publications. And she's also played a really um, strong role in identifying sources for gaps in our collection. We, um, the collection of all University of Montana publications has been a little inconsistent in the past. And due to her longevity on the campus and all of her connections, she's able to very easily find the little stashes of um, publications that might be in various offices across campus. And I also have one staff member in monograph acquisitions working on copyright clearance and uploading faculty articles in the IR. And while, while I was implementing some of these new tasks, I observed that there, there are various skills often present in acquisitions and e-resource units. And some of the folks who were very interested in electronic data took to the task very well. And I was surprised to learn that even the staff involved with more traditional print roles were equally interested and excited to get involved. And so that it taught me to make sure that I'm providing opportunities for everyone and not excluding people who may not have clear um, like, for example, the monographic acquisition specialist, she may have been overlooked, but because we needed so much help, she was included in the project, and it turned out that her work was highly value, valued. So this next section of the presentation will draw connections between some of the traditional skill sets of ERLs and those needed in digital scholarship and scholarly communication. The NASIG core competencies will be discussed, and I'll follow with some examples of some of the new opportunities discussed in some general library literature. So to give a quick overview of the main topics of the core competencies, I'll go over uh, the first section deals with the life cycle of electronic resources, including topics such as the acquisitions, licensing, knowledge of metadata, cataloging standards, and uh, topics such as records management. The second section deals with technology. As many of us know, the management of electronic resources requires one to be very comfortable with electronic and, um, information and how it's delivered, such as the computer hardware, the software, various standards, uh, preservation issues and tools, Markup language is also helpful, and there's um, just a whole host of information and systems like link resolvers that e-resource librarians must know about. The third section of the core competency addresses research and assessment, and this is focused on the ability to collect and analyze and manipulate to data to provide a meaningful interpretation. It, it also addresses um, the ability to use established research methods. The fourth section addresses effective communication skills and, and an emphasis on the ability to interact with a wide audience. The fifth area, the supervision and management, highlights the importance of the ability to effectively supervise, train, and motivate staff. It also um, highlights the need for an ERL to establish and maintain effective working relationships. The sixth area, reminds ERLs that there's a commitment to maintaining knowledge and current issues expected in the field. And the final area, personal qualities, it emphasizes that flexibility, open-mindedness, and the ability to function in a dynamic and rapidly changing environment is extremely important to the field. And these competencies sprung from Dr. Sarah Sutton's dissertation entitled Identifying Core Competencies for the Electronic Resource Librarians in the 21st Century Library. The core competencies have codified key skills in the management of electronic resources and helped ERLs define and express the parameters of our specialty to others. And this next section will illustrate how the core competencies have provided a basis to compare existing electronic resource management skills to those needed to support digital scholarship and scholarly communication. So the first area deals with the life cycle of e-resources. And many of the materials and objects of interest generated by the DH scholars 
and librarians involved with scholarly communications revolve around electronic resources and electronic systems. The key differences is that the, many of the objects are born digital, but areas such as copyright, metadata, rights management, and record management remains important. The second area with, deals with technology, and DSSC shares the same technological environment with traditional electronic resources. The same technology skills that facilitate the management of electronic resources can be applied to DSSC. And specifically, Section 2.8 of the NASIG core competency states, as digital scholarship becomes the norm, future electronic resource librarians may also need a thorough understanding of emerging digital preservation techniques and technologies such as data visualization, file computing, and text mining. An ERL is accustomed to gathering data and researching best practice and the importance of assessment in traditional electronic resource management. And these skills are helpful in DSSC as it's important to demonstrate the value of these programs to stakeholders outside of the library, especially when developing new services. Especially in a time um, of dwindling budgets, it's important to create a plan to assess and to continually improve and to show that any new or any new programs implemented do have an impact and they fit the needs of the users on campus. Effective communication is pretty clearly helpful in all fields. In the realm of DSSC, the ERL is a valuable tool for marketing and highlighting the benefits of new library initiatives to support DSSC. And I've seen that this um, has been em um, employed in libraries, of sending out uh, various librarians to, uh, to talk to faculty at their faculty meetings and uh, various department meetings to help promote and to explain why uh, digital scholarship and scholarly communication activities are really important to the campus and to the library. Many initiatives in DSSC are project-based and they require management of resource and personnel. And these skills are especially important during the launch and the piloting of new initiatives. The ERL is committed to maintaining awareness of new developments in library science, specifically section 6.1 addresses the fact that scholarly communication trends are already in the domain of the ERL, who is committed to maintaining knowledge of current issues and trends in scholarly communications and the library's dual role as a content access provider and content generator. I'm sorry, the button to move slides is pretty small and I keep missing it. Okay, there I go. All right, the uh, seventh area, the personal qualities described in the core competencies are applicable to any discipline. The ERL is expected to be flexible and agile due to the quickly evolving nature of electronic resources. And the ability to manage the complexities of electronic resources applies directly to DSSC. One area that comes to mind is discussing author rights and fair use to faculty. Uh, there are often aren't clear-cut guidelines, and especially with fair use, it requires um, weighing options and making the best risk assessment. So in this area, being flexible and agile will help uh, negotiate some of the more sticky points of scholarly communication. Rick Anderson suggested during a question answer period of his 2012 Nation Vision session that librarians should be asking ourselves what scholars will need from libraries and librarians. And this is exactly the question that informs this next portion of this presentation. 
Robertson and Simpson's 2012 presentation, Managing E-Publishing Perfect Harmony for Serials, describes several new roles to support library-based publishing. Both presenters are serials who transitioned into scholarly communication roles. And some of the new tasks they mentioned were managing cross doi managing directory of open access journal metadata, requesting ISSNs, managing the online appearance of journals published by the library, training editors, managing subscription access, digitizing back content of hosted journals, providing metadata, and troubleshooting issues. And so not only does their article describe these new roles, the authors discussed how serial specialists are uniquely prepared for success in the aforementioned new roles. And I have included three slides from uh, that list some of the areas that I've that I've just read off. And what I found very helpful in the article is the connections that were made. And I think it's important to show these because it's a nice familiar ground to get started, especially when asking staff to get involved in brand new areas. If you can show that you're coming from a place of expertise and then moving on to these new areas, I think it makes the transition much easier for people who may have a little bit of trepidation over expanding into new areas. Tosaka and Wang described additional roles for IR work, including content recruitment through outreach to faculty for publication, uh, rights management, copyright clearance, and journal website customization. The author emphasized the importance of communicating to the faculty about the benefits of the IR, which can be accomplished through reports and documentation, campus-wide marketing, and partnerships with the faculty involved in digital humanities. It also include data curation and some similar areas. Sasaka and Wang stated that research partnerships and digitization projects should be guided by researcher needs. Rick Anderson also noted in that 2012 vision session that librarians could use skills in curating data sets, which, uh, which represents a growing and quickly evolving need. And librarians could also be useful in this role as advocates to encourage faculty members to care about what happens to their data after an article is published. And another area to consider is with federal grants, data management plans are becoming the norm. And this is an area where librarians can offer some expertise. It is also mentioned in the NACI core competencies as an area that an ERL should be versed in. So the examples above from the NASA conference presentations and other literature can be categorized into three skill areas. And that first area is metadata management, such as creation and maintenance of uh, the DOI's ISSNs and copyright data. And the second area, management of IR activity, and that would include journal publishing and also archiving and marketing the importance of an IR. And the third area would be supporting research needs of scholars through partnerships and activities such as archiving data sets. So in addition to the suggested activities found in ASIC's presentation, text mining came up fairly often in the literature. And this was an area where librarians are well suited to lend assistance. Kamada noted in reference to text mining, that these kinds of research involve not just the knowledge of the relevant computer applications, but also skills and knowledge in collecting and organizing data, in which librarians have had unique training and background. Librarians can play a role also in assisting faculty during the tenure and review process. Carpenter et al. in their article, envisioning the library role in scholarly communications in the year 2025, asserted that librarians need to be taught how to talk to faculty about open access, the peer review process, and then tenure and promotion concerns in order to gain a greater understanding of faculty as authors and to develop better knowledge of publishing as a whole. And of course, this mostly applies to places where librarians are not on the tenure track. For those of us who are on the tenure track, we're quite aware of the requirements uh, and some of the demands of P3 
peer review publishing and tenure and promotion. Librarians have a long history of providing consulting services, uh, for example, on the reference desk. And in general, this has prepared us well to provide consults on topics relevant to authors, such as their author rights, uh, fair use analyses, copyright, data management plans, grant preparation, um, and grant requirement compliance. In summary, there are a multitude of, avail of opportunities available in DSSC for librarians in general and ERL specifically. Reviewing the current library literature has produced num numerous examples of these new roles. I think that NASIG is well equipped to take a lead and has already begun work on drafting core competencies and scholarly communication. NASIG's Previous work has already produced a comprehensive document outlining electronic resource librarians' roles, and I believe that NASIG is sufficiently prepared to produce a final core competencies and scholarly communications that can have a broad impact. So this presentation has highlighted a number of people involved with NASIG who have pract practical experience in this area. An active member William Joseph Thomas has suggested a few competencies in a study that he conducted to determine how libraries are structured to support scholarly communication. He compared his study results to a number of sources in the literature, but most prominently, he compared and contrasted his results with an ARL kit 332 called Organization of Scholarly Communication Services. Thomas suggested I should turn my slide, sorry, <laughs> that the following areas of scholarly communication activities are available, um, such as open access. Librarians could help authors make their work open access and advise on this issue. You can understand a variety of publishing models and give information and this, um, assistance as needed. You could help with copyright and publishing agreements. Um, advise patrons on the use of copyright, uh, especially in the, uh, the fair use area, and to make sure that patrons are using materials fairly. You can also consult with authors on their publishing agreements to help make refinements that allow for use in, in um, institutional repositories. Some of the other available activities could be research support, and also help users evaluate OA resources for their literature reviews. And then another area was suggested help authors comply with funding mandates. And his, his article alone provides quite a basis um, for competencies in the area. So instead of looking at this shift to maintain our relevance, it should be seen as one or more ways to meet the needs of library users. Sponsor in the article, No Half Measures, Overcoming Challenges to Doing Digital Humanities in the Library, discusses the challenges professionals face when supporting digital humanities in libraries. The author made a compelling statement that speaks to why we need to become involved in digital scholarship. The success of digital humanities in libraries currently depends on the energy creativity, and the goodwill of a few overextended library professionals and services that they can cobble together. So I hope that this presentation has highlighted a few areas that we could come together and serve our user communities in a much better and co cohesive and planned way. And I hope that we can make a difference at our local libraries by employing these methods. So thank you um, for listening to my presentation, and I'll take questions and comments. Thank you, Angela. Um, we haven't received any questions at the moment, but if you are listening in and you have any questions, please just go ahead and input them in the Q&A.
All right. So we've had we have one question. Um, Angela, how long has the University of Montana had their IR? It's been almost two years. Um, another follow-up question regarding the IR. Um, how are you currently assessing the impact of the institutional repository? And so um, some of the reviews that have been going on, they're mostly focused in, an, in another area of the library, but her reports have focused on presenting um, use and download um, statistics from various areas um, of the globe. Our university has strategic missions um, in global impact, and so those stats have been pulled to um, to make the case that the IR is um, used on a global scale. Another related question, um, do undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty supply their own metadata when submitting their works? Currently, what they submit would be um, an abstract. For, well, for students, they often don't have um, complete resumes or CVs. So the students would send an email with, with their data, with the title metadata, their author um, information and abstracts, and that type of um, metadata would be entered into the system on their behalf. We haven't really opened that up for um, end users to input their own information. Um, as far as faculty, the service that we provide is that they they submit a CV or a resume and library staff um, search their resume, do the copyright clearance, and then <clears throat> and then the the staff here enter the metadata and upload it for them. Um, and just as a reminder, um, which platform are you utilizing? It's the B Press. And then we had another question. Um, could you recommend any best practices or workflows for um, DC or scholarly communications? You know, I'm still at the stage uh, with researching and trying to um, focus on expanding electronic resource librarians' roles into these areas, so I'm not able to provide um, pointers to specific best practices at this time. I mean, my hope is that the NASIG core competency and scholarly communications could serve as a starting point for best practices. Um, Angela, you mentioned publishing a journal in the IR. Um, is this a journal that is newly born within the IR, or was it originally available in print? We, uh, we had just one more question. Um, Angela, you mentioned publishing a journal in the IR. Um, is this a journal that is newly born within the IR, or was it originally available in print or electronically somewhere else? Uh, it was a situation where the journal was being published and the department needed help to continue the publication funding had decreased, and so the IR uh, became a way to um, kind of lengthen the future and to rescue it from a cessation. Um, could you recommend any data rights management tools? No, I don't have any suggestions with data rights management tools.
we had a follow-up question about the journal that's published in the IR. Um, has it been, is it indexed or is it in the um, DOAJ or in the link resolvers? Um, I apologize, we might be having some audio difficulties, uh, but we did have one more question for Angela. Um, did, is the journal that's published in the IR um, indexed? Uh, is it in the DOHA or included in your link resolver? Yes. And that was, I mean, that was a, an established, um, the, it was published electronically, just not on a B press software. So the metadata was sent out previously. Um, so that wasn't, I mean, that was already in place and then uh, it moved to the B press platform. We had a related follow-up question. Um, are you adding any open access journals from other institutions, IRs, to your library catalog or link resolver? We had a follow-up question related to the open access journal. Um, are you, is the University of Montana, Missoula adding any open access journals from other institutions, IRs, to your library catalog or link resolver? We've just implemented Primo and we were on a knowledge, uh, we were on the serial solutions knowledge base. And so when we were on serial solutions, uh, we did track the package um, of OA journals. And so that's uh, something that's under consideration. So we have tracked selected open access journals in our knowledge base. Um, and another question about the content in your IR. Um, are you digitizing previously printed works that the university published for storage in the IR? Um, if so, what kinds of works are you digitizing? I think a, a great example of one work we're digitizing was Sentinel, which was the yearbook um, that was published. And so that's um, something that is being digitized right now and it's one of our major projects. Um, it's currently being scanned and the process is a little slow because we have to provide pretty complete information um, for accessibility issues for people who are blind and have other um, sight issues. So we're working on that um, project and that is a, a complete re what we What's the first time that we have digitized this material and um, making it available to a very wide audience. We're also, um, we're also focusing on some of the um, UN publications, so some of the very early newsletters also need to be digitized as well. But of course, the same um, the same problem, the optical character recognition just isn't providing um, an acceptable level of accessibility, and so that's that's a slower process. But the main focus has been on that um, that yearbook.
We have about five more minutes. Um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, feel free to put them into the Q&A box. We had another question. Um, Angela, how is your university following up with grant requirements? Uh, I guess I need to, would follow up on that question. Um, the university or the library? The library. Just the library, OK. okay. Um, so the library really hasn't involved ourselves with any type of follow up. Um, on these issues, we really haven't been asked to do a whole lot. It's an area that we could provide services on. The university in general does have several um, staff members who um, monitor the, um, especially kind of the financial aspects of grant applications and um, fulfilling the requirements. We did have one more question. Um, Angela, could you talk about any exciting future developments for the IR? Well, I, I tend to think the um, exciting developments for our local IR, I'm especially interested in our, um, some of the university publications. I'm interested especially in some of the student information. I haven't really seen that a lot of institutions are digitizing um, student senate minutes and resolutions. Um, I mean, I'm excited that we give so much opportunity to the students of the University of Montana to take part in the IR as well. And there's a, a few student groups that have kind of given their feedback and have shaped some of the things that have gone into the IR. Um, I'm quite excited about the conferences that are held on campus for the students, the graduate research seminar and the undergraduate research conference, those two, um, those two activities are well known on our campus and it's, it is an honor to be a part of it and I think it's, that it's excellent that the, the library is helping out on so many stages of that, even from printing out poster sessions and then saving those files into the IR. Now, I think that's probably the most exciting, all these small local projects that are creating this nice mass of history. It's really recording what's going on and can tell a story. We had another question. Um, how are you able to get the word out to faculty about using DIR? Uh, one of the main ways that we've done that is attending. Um, we have a um, a structure of liaison librarians and subject selectors, and they have they have been uh, not so much tasks, but we've all had an agreement that we would talk to our faculty members and the students in our liaison areas about the IR and explain the importance of it. And I mean, it's been a it, it's I guess it's a ground up movement. We try to make connections um, through our committee work that we've done through the classes that we teach. It's really just to spread the knowledge that the IR exists and then to work with people to understand why it really benefits them. And of course, um, we also have a, um, a set of seminars on campus that the, um, it's a professional development series where faculty and librarians have given a few presentations on the IR data management um, there's some on linked data, so the librarians do give frequent um, or regular sessions uh, to the campus-wide faculty development group. We have about two minutes left if anyone has any more questions for Angela.
We did have a, a comment um, to Angela. Thank you for sharing that um, because this person has an IR and they were wondering how to spread the word. But I don't see any more questions um, at this time. Um, if you have any more comments or questions, um, you can feel free to get in touch with NASIC CEC or Angela uh, directly. Um, and on behalf of NASIC, thank you, Angela, for sharing your experience today. And thank you to everyone for attending our February webinar. Uh, we hope to see you at one of our next events and take care.